Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Just a couple quick announcements. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you those of you who wrote to me last week because you're interested in participating in our research project on eating disorders. So if you are an anorexic who is practicing anorexic behavior right now or recovered or you know somebody who is, have them write to me at pampopper at msn.com. We need a batch of people to interview for this project and um, uh, we will make sure that you get rewarded for helping us and that uh, we will, when the finished product is done, we'll share it with you, okay? Um, second thing is that some of you are emailing me also about getting involved in teaching, becoming brand ambassadors, affiliates, starting Operation Healthy Girlfriend chapters. Keep those emails coming. I have lots of telephone calls scheduled with some of you. Love that because we're trying to grow this into a huge enterprise where we really teach everybody in the world about informed medical decision making and diet and lifestyle change. So if you want to talk to me, email me. I do actually set up times to talk to people on the phone. Um, last thing remember, or next to last thing remember, Neil Barnard will be in Columbus on um, June 19th, free lecture, 7 p.m. Do make a reservation. We always turn people away because he brings a crowd. And last but not least, we think I think we have three weeks left until the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course starts during the summer. And that's where the celebrity instructors like Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Moss, Dr. Schultz, I mean, we have all the amazing people that you want to learn from uh, live and interactive via teleconference call on Wednesday night. So if any of these things that I'm talking to you about are interesting, Pam Popper at msn.com. I will send you information, we can set up a time to talk, and we would love to have more of you become members of our Wellness Forum Health family. Okay, so today's topic, we're going to talk about lectins. And the reason we're going to talk about lectins, I'll tell you what they are in a minute, is because I get so many emails from people who ask me if they should avoid foods that are high in lectins. So here goes. Lectins were discovered over 100 years ago. The word lectin comes from the Latin legere, which means to select. Um, these um, proteins are found in animals, plants, microorganisms, and the human body. Lectins perform many functions. In plants, they serve as natural insecticides that protect the plant in its natural environment. E. coli contains lectins, which allow the bacteria to attach to the epithelial cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Now, that may sound like a bad thing, but all of us do have a little bit of E. coli in our GI tract. We just have more beneficial bacteria than pathogenic bacteria for healthy people. People. Humans have provided residence for lectins for most of our time on the planet. Some of the earliest research on lectins was conducted by Peter Herman Stillmark, who isolated ricin, an extremely toxic lectin from the castor plant. The concentration of lectin in, cancer, in, in castor beans is so high that the beans are considered toxic. And this may have been the beginning of misunderstandings about lectins. The potential problems with lectins were made more public in 1988 when a hospital in the UK served a lunch that was thought to be healthy to some staff people. One of the dishes contained kidney beans. Well, several hours after lunch, a surgeon got sick in the operating room and others experienced both vomiting and diarrhea. Everybody recovered. Tests showed that there was no food poisoning, but what did happen was partially cooked red kidney beans, which have a very high concentration of a particular lectin, were included in the dish. Now, most lectins are not toxic. All of them are inactivated during cooking, so fully cooked beans, including kidney beans, are safe to eat. Canned beans are also safe. In this case, as I mentioned before, the problem was that the kidney beans were not completely cooked, and that's what caused the problem. Lectins are concentrated in legumes, such as kidney beans, black beans, soybeans, lima beans, and lentils, and also in many grains. When humans eat these foods, soon after they've been cooked, the lectins bind to the carbohydrates and pass through the GI tract without being absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, as a result, lectins are sometimes referred to as anti-nutrients. It's a term used to describe food constituents that are just considered worthless since they're not digestible and they don't get absorbed into the, or through the GI tract and into the bloodstream. It's important to note here, however, that at one point in time, fiber was considered an anti-nutrient because for a very long period of time, nobody knew what the role of fiber actually was. Well, there are a few things that most nutrition experts agree on. 
but I think almost all would agree that fiber is very beneficial for health and the more of it people consume the better. So the fact that lectins are not um, absorbed into the bloodstream doesn't necessarily mean that they don't play a role, we're just not entirely sure what it is at this point in time, although I will come to some um, interesting evidence showing that it may actually be beneficial. The claim that lectins and the foods that contain them, mostly beans and grains, are dangerous is not supported by evidence. In fact, healthy populations have eaten large amounts of both beans and grains for thousands of years, and today people living in the blue zones, which are the longest lived people on the planet, include copious amounts of both beans and grains in their diet. Some of the most outspoken people against lectin-containing foods are the paleo advocates, including Lauren Cordain, author of the book The Paleo Diet. In his book, Cordain refers to an article that he co-authored that discusses a connection between lectins and rheumatoid arthritis. Well, I had never read the article, so I decided that in preparation of having this discussion today, I would read the article. And the section pertaining to diet and rheumatoid arthritis referenced studies showing a connection between dairy, cereal products, and gluten with rheumatoid arthritis. The article reports studies in which patients improved on an elemental diet, reports that celiac patients improve after eliminating gluten, and that removing gluten-containing grains helps celiac patients and rheumatoid arthritis patients get better. Cordain and colleagues also report that fasting helps both celiac and rheumatoid arthritis patients and that RA and celiac have been showed to, shown to occur concurrently in many, many patients. Um, there are no, this was the whole diet section and there weren't any studies in the diet section that had much to do with lectins at all. The rest of the article hypothesizes about how lectins might contribute to RA, but in the summary, the authors state that dietary glycoproteins and other substances may induce changes in the intestines that allow more antigens to enter the bloodstream and that cross-reactivity or molecular mimicry can then lead to RA. They then propose that eliminating several dietary factors, including lectins, might result in a reduction in symptoms uh, in some but not all RA patients. And I guess at the end of reading all of this, I just wondered, how can you cite this as evidence that, um, that lectins are harmful for health? Um, in fact, the article was mostly about other things, and the conclusion had more to do with leaky gut and things getting into the bloodstream that shouldn't uh, than it did with lectin-containing lectin foods having a negative effect on autoimmune patients or people with RA. Now, while Cordain and many others theorize about the effect of lectins and lectin-containing foods on conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, population studies refute this hypothesis. In countries that have a high intake of beans, which contain lectins, the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune diseases in general is very low. For example, in Burundi, pulses comprise 55% of protein intake. In Rwanda, it's 38%. Uganda, 20%. Kenya, 20%. In industrialized countries like the United States, the incidence of RA is someplace between 0.3 and 1%. It's lower in developing countries and is almost non-existent in African countries like the ones that I mentioned above. The real cause of rheumatoid arthritis, according to an analysis of data from several countries, the strongest dietary association between diet and rheumatoid arthritis is shown to be meat and fat. The problem is not lectins and beans and grains, the problem is animal foods. And this article is about lectins, so I didn't copy over all of the research I have showing that autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, it's meat and dairy that's the problem, not, um, not plant foods, but um, we'll go back to the discussion of lectins here. Now, not all lectins are toxic. Those that are toxic are neutralized by cooking and some are actually beneficial. Lectins in plant foods have been found to inhibit the development of cancer and to have anti-cancer and anti-tumor effects. Some studies show that lectins in soybeans have been effective in breaking down cancer cells, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Well, in addition to the paleo dieters, who else thinks that this lectin theory, avoiding lectins, is good for health? Well, Peter Dodamo, author of The Blood Type Diet, and the Weston Price Foundation, the group that advises people to eat lard and drink raw milk products. Um, all advocates of the avoid lectin-containing foods theory. 
Well, both the Damo and the Weston Price members have serious credibility issues, and I've dealt with those in other uh, video clips, and you can read the articles that I've written in the Health Brace Library. Again, I didn't copy all of this over. This, this video clip would have gone on for five days if I had taken in all the other ancillary information. I'm just going to trust you can go find that someplace else because I've written and documented that completely. Many other foods besides beans and grains contain lectins too. Things like tomatoes, corn, nuts, seeds, and some fruit. Those warning people about lectins are not advising people to stay away from these foods. Um, so I, again, I think that's misunderstanding about this that's fueling all of this. Now there's one caveat that I'm going to mention about lectin containing foods. Some people are sensitive to some of them and patients with autoimmune diseases including rheumatoid arthritis are the most likely. Most autoimmune patients have better outcomes if they avoid high gluten foods like barley, rye, oats, and wheat, although most can eat all other grains. Celiac patients have to consume a medically gluten-free diet. A very small percentage of autoimmune patients find that they're sensitive to foods in addition to the usual triggers, which are gluten and dairy. These sensitivities are identified with an elimination diet, which we try after adopting a wellness form health style diet if there still are some unresolved issues. Um, and any food is a possibility, not just lectin foods. The sister of a staff member discovered that her psoriasis was triggered with bananas, which is kind of unusual. Um, but the best way for patients to figure this out is to start their journey to health with a wellness form health style diet with um, adjuvants such as probiotics. And then for most that's all that's required, but for those that have remaining issues, an elimination diet, which it takes a long time and is a little bit aggravating, can then be done. And um, we find that the trigger foods are just as likely to be something other than uh, lectin-containing foods or the other usual suspects that people say are usual suspects, nightshade foods, uh, just as easily, just as likely to be foods other than those foods than they are to be those foods. So I think the confusion over lectins is fueled by misinformation that is dispensed by individuals and groups who I don't think know a lot about diet and health and who often try to apply food restrictions that benefit a small number of people to the general population. The author of Wheat Belly, for example, cites studies showing that celiac patients improve on a gluten-free diet and on that basis advises that all people would benefit from a gluten-free diet. This stance is like saying that because some people have near fatal reactions to peanuts that all people should avoid eating peanut butter and that's just plain silly. The bottom line is that most people not only benefit but thrive on lectin containing foods like beans and grains and until you have absolute confirmation that you're one of the people who doesn't, the small percentage of people who are sensitive, don't eliminate these great foods from your diet. So I hope that this can um, helps to sort out some of the confusion about lectins. I, again, I think early research sometimes becomes um, a dogma before we know the rest of the story. And I've said this about protein. One of the reasons why people revere protein foods is it was the first nutrient identified. And at the time, you don't know that there are 100,000 more you're going to find out about, so protein became quite the thing. Now it's not, it's turned out not to be so as so important as everybody thought, as in, you know, some people think you can't eat enough of it. So I think we have to put things in perspective and, and look at this with an organized and scientific point of view, and that's sorely missing in the diet and health field these days. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.